Good evening. I'm Heather Hiscox, and this is The National. A bustling Barcelona tourist area is turned into a killing zone as a van mows down pedestrians in another terror attack. And a mother and child reunion, three years and one war in the making. You'll want to see this Winnipeg embrace. And with so many questions about next week's solar eclipse. It's more than just the moon passing in front of the sun. The whole environment changes. We just had to ask Bob. It was a picture perfect day on one of the great boulevards of the world, but in an instant it turned into a sea of carnage. A van deliberately drove through the huge crowds. 13 people were killed and more than 100 others injured in what police confirm was a terrorist attack. Tonight, the area remains on high alert. Late tonight, this scene, Spanish police converged on the town of Cambril, south of Barcelona, killing four suspects and injuring a fifth after what they say was another attempted terrorist attack. Now, this all began this afternoon in Barcelona, in the heart of the city, the tourist district known as Las Ramblas, an area still under lockdown tonight. Adrian Arsenault begins our coverage. Deep into the Barcelona night still a sense the danger is not yet done. A manhunt for a murderous driver still underway, tourists still locked down or locked out, reliving what they'd seen hours earlier. I heard the sound of a crash, um, screams at the same time. Think of it, Las Ramblas, a famed pathway so crammed on summer days, it's pickpockets who are the usual worry. Come on, come on, come on. Just come on. At 5 p.m. today, though, utter panic. And what you're about to see is especially ugly. A white van had jumped off the narrow road into the center pedestrian mall, zigzagging at nearly 80 kilometers an hour, clearly aiming to kill. It's super fuerte, tío. Niños y todo, tío. Madres y niños pequeños muertos en medio de las ramblas, tío. I saw a white van with the side door open. Um, we, we heard uh, gunshots, whether it was the police or from the van, I don't know. Las Ramblas was just teeming with tourists, an elderly couple still seeming to clutch each other on the pavement. Here's the path of that van. It was rented earlier in the day. The driver first raced onto Las Ramblas right here at Plaza de la Catalunya. He ran over people for up to half a kilometer before finally stopping. Police locked down nearby train and metro stations and all the exits to the city. Then more panic shortly after the first attack. A car ran a police checkpoint a few kilometers from Las Ramblas, hitting two cops. Gunshots were later exchanged, one potential suspect killed. It got so confusing, police arrested two other men and found a vehicle on the outskirts of the city that had been rented at the same time as the van. But still, no sign of the attacker. Was he planning something else? Was he alone? Come on, come on. Come with me. In the shock, rumors of more threats, reports of someone taking hostages. That wasn't true, but periodically people surged down streets. For hours, the scared stayed locked inside stores. In the midst of this, a claim of responsibility on the ISIS news agency Amak. Counterterrorism analysts find the message and the speed of it telling. So what that strongly suggests is that the group has been carefully coordinating this activity with the people who are involved in this wider set of plots, if you will. Uh, it also stands to reason that it's quite possible somebody who has been deployed from within the so-called caliphate uh, to coordinate these activities is doing just that right now in Spain. It's rare for ISIS to claim something if there isn't some sort of connection, but what was it? Police say it was this man's documentation used to rent the van. He's Dries Ubeker. Police know him, but not as a terror threat. He's telling them his ID had been stolen, possibly by his brother. So if the driver was somehow affiliated with ISIS, that would make this the first ISIS attack in Spain. It's tried before. Dozens of attacks have been foiled. Late last year, 
This man was arrested for plotting to drive a truck through a Spanish Christmas market. And yes, that horrific tactic is being copied again and again throughout Europe in particular. It's such a threat, it seems that the CIA warned Spanish authorities a few months ago that Las Ramblas was especially vulnerable to a vehicle attack and needed more protection. Now, Adrian joins me with more. There have been some late developments mm -hmm. on this second attempted attack in Cambrils. What we're understanding is that Cambrils is currently under control. That's really important to them. Police are also learning, though, that this was, again, an attempt to use a vehicle, that a van mounted a pedestrian walkway. It flipped, however, and the four occupants of that van were then shot by police. One detail they have yet to confirm is whether these men were wearing explosive belts. There are a few suggestions they were, but that will be a really important detail for them to sort out. They've, they've learned a lot, the police, in the last couple hours. For example, they really believe what happened in Barcelona was destined to be a lot more complicated. I think we have a little bit of video to show you that, that might explain this. Let's have a look. What you should be seeing are pictures of, of debris at a house uh, there was an explosion in this house about 200 kilometers outside of Barcelona yesterday. Now, one person was killed. Uh, police and firefighters rushed to help. 16 other people were, were then injured when there was a second explosion. Initially, this was written off as strictly being a gas explosion. Maybe canisters had gone off. They now believe, police, that this was connected to the Barcelona attack. Perhaps these were explosives that detonated early. They are incredibly concerned about that. Okay. Can we talk a little bit more about the fact that, as you say, we are again dealing with a vehicle attack? Mm -hmm. Authorities seem powerless to prevent them. Well, you know, unfortunately, Canadians know all about how difficult that is. If you think back Heather, to October 2014, Martin couture uh, who ran over two soldiers with his vehicle, he, was, he killed warrant officer Patrice Vincent. Police knew all about uh, couture Rouleau. They had taken away his passport. They had uh, spoken with his parents in an attempt to sort of de-radicalize him. They knew everything they could about him, and yet they could not stop that. You know, short of putting barriers on every street, impossible. Uh, it's very, very difficult for them to deal with it. This is a diabolical tactic. And used again today to devastating effect in Barcelona. All right, Adrian, thank you very much. You're Since last summer, more than 100 people have been killed in ISIS-inspired vehicle attacks in Europe. In addition to the lives lost in Barcelona today, several people were killed in two separate vehicle attacks in London just this spring, both on bridges. In Stockholm, four died when a hijacked beer truck hit pedestrians outside a department store. In Berlin, another hijacked truck targeted shoppers at a Christmas market. 12 people were killed in that incident. But the most deadly vehicle attack was in July of last year in Nice, France. A cargo truck drove through the crowd celebrating Bastille Day. 86 people were killed and 450 others were injured. Global Affairs Canada says there are no reports of Canadians killed or hurt in today's attacks. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is among many world leaders condemning the bloodshed. But take note of what the U.S. president said as he offered his condolences. On Twitter, Donald Trump called what happened in Barcelona a terror attack. He's been criticized for refusing to call the recent vehicle attack in Charlottesville, Virginia, terrorism. One person was killed and 19 others injured when a man drove a car into a crowd protesting against white supremacists. We're keeping a close eye on the situation in Spain and we'll give you an update later in the program. Donald Trump is digging in his heels on the events in Charlottesville and the Confederate statue that sparked the confrontation. Today, the U.S. president tweeted his displeasure that cities are removing their monuments and drew even more criticism in the process. The CBC's Lindsay Duncombe has the latest from Washington. I hope there will be radical, radical changes. Some of the sharpest criticism of Donald Trump tonight is coming from an unexpected source, a Republican in the Deep South. The president has not yet been able to demonstrate the stability uh, nor some of the competence that he needs to demonstrate. With that, Corker seems to question the president's fitness for office in a way few elected Republicans have dared. He also recently has not demonstrated that he understands the character of this nation. 
Corker added his voice to the growing criticism of how Donald Trump continues to respond to what happened in Charlottesville. This morning, Trump tweeted about the Confederate statues and monuments being removed in several cities. He said, sad to see the history and culture of our great country being ripped apart. Can't change history, but you can learn from it. Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, who's next? Washington, Jefferson, so foolish. Critics point out the president ignores the nuances of history here. Many of the now controversial statues were put up decades after the Civil War ended at points in history where race relations were especially bad. And while Presidents Jefferson and Washington both owned slaves, neither went to war to defend the practice. Much of Trump's racial rhetoric has been attributed to this man. Steve Bannon is the former boss of a far-right news service, now a senior White House advisor. He reached out to a left-leaning journalist and called the far-right fringe a collection of clowns and losers, but argued the race debate helps Trump, saying if the left is focused on race and identity and we go with economic nationalism, we can crush the Democrats. Despite reports Bannon could be fired soon, the president's tweets appear to be in line with that strategy. Instead of trying to calm the racial debate here, Trump is fueling it. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Coming up, the number of displaced South Sudanese reaches a grim milestone. We'll take another look at what Margaret Evans saw on the ground and... Just in time for next week's solar eclipse. They're a great excuse to travel, and it's one of the most spectacular sights you can see. A special edition of Ask Bob. The numbers are in, and they are staggering. Ottawa has released the latest statistics on migrants crossing illegally into Canada this summer. And as the CBC's Kate McKenna tells us, officials are calling the situation extraordinary. 1,200 people are staying in this migrant camp on the New York border, waiting for processing, and their numbers are growing. You are asking me how unusual those numbers are. They're unprecedented. We've never seen those numbers. In June, 781 migrants illegally crossed. In July, that number soared to almost 3,000. And so far this month, the July figure has already been surpassed, with more than 3,800 crossing over. At the St. Bernard de la Colle Port of Entry, we continue to see a steady float of asylum seekers being brought each day. Officials say they've managed to triple the number of asylum claims processed per day at the Montreal office. It's important that Canadians know that this is a situation that, yes, is out of the ordinary, but is very much under control. But more is needed. Today, Marc Garneau pledged to add 20 more people to a claims processing centre in Montreal to open a new shelter in Cornwall, Ontario, with at least 300 extra rooms and to set up a public task force to coordinate efforts. Officials did confirm what was already widely believed, that 85% of the people living in these tents are Haitian nationals coming here from the United States. The American government has threatened to revoke the special status that allows Haitians to stay in the U.S., and that's led to a viral rumor that Haitian migrants are welcome in Canada. But here, Haitians have no special status and would have to qualify as refugees. Garneau says the government is trying to counter that rumor with facts. It's imp- important to uh, combat that uh, misinformation that is out there. Imagine that if you're a family coming to uh, Canada thinking that uh, you just have to come uh, and you are told that uh, you do not qualify. But despite Garneau's reassurance, more than 200 people a day are still crossing the border illegally. As for the Haitians who are risking everything to avoid deportation back to Haiti, they could still end up there if they're denied refugee status here. And in all likelihood, that will be the fate of at least half of them. Kate McKenna, CBC News, St. Bernard de la Colle, Quebec. Reunions are often emotional, but not quite like the one today in Winnipeg. For three years, Nofa Zagla wondered if her son, Ahmed, was alive. They were separated when ISIS captured the Yazidi family in Iraq. Zagla and four of her children escaped and came to Canada as refugees. It wasn't until last month, when his photo surfaced on social media, that she learned Ahmed had survived. Karen Pauls has our story. <laughs> Mother and son met with family and close friends in a private area of the Winnipeg airport. Video posted on Facebook reveals an emotional reunion. 
Within minutes, though, Ahmad and his mother, Nofa Zagla, faced the media repeating this message. Thank you, Canada. Thank you, Sima. I'm thankful for the Canadian government and Sima and anyone that had any part in reuniting us. Steve Maman is the head of a Montreal-based group called the Liberation of Christian and Yazidi Children of Iraq. He's behind an aggressive advocacy campaign calling on the Trudeau government to expedite this case. Had we not raised awareness, everybody involved, and they said, had you not acted this way, you would have never received such an expedited response for Ahmad. But critics say it was unnecessary to start a crowdfunding account for a family whose expenses are covered for the first year by the federal government. They say posting details of this case on social media puts extended family members in Iraq in danger. It's a really fine line between doing them harm and doing them good. It's very easy to exploit these situations. Federal immigration officials won't comment on this specific case, but the family's resettlement caseworker in Winnipeg says Ottawa was already working on this by the time Maman started his campaign. I know they had um, um, sent emails and uh, spoke with RCC, but that has nothing to do with the process that we had in place. We are asked the federal government to speed it up, and they did, and it's completed. We are thankful that it's well done. Maman defends his work and says it's the end result that matters. We've got to save the world, in my opinion, one life at a time. There's an opportunity in front of us, and it's Ahmad. Ahmad's alive, and we need to bring Ahmad today. Through a translator, Ahmad says there are many more who need help. <laughs> but there's a thousand other kids like me that are still held captive. So I want to share my story so that they, someone can help those others that are still held captive and are still in danger. Words from a boy who knows just how much is at stake. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Three leaders of Hong Kong's democracy movement have been sentenced to jail for their roles in anti-government protests in 2014. Joshua Wong and two friends started the so-called Umbrella Movement, a two-month-long protest against what many saw as Beijing's creeping control over Hong Kong's politics. Today's decision overturned a lower court ruling that gave the three no prison time. They will now spend several months in jail. South Sudan is also in the news again. Ahead tonight, an update on the generosity of Canadians, plus a look back with Margaret Evans. First, let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX lost 48 points. The dollar increased slightly. In New York, the Dow fell 274 points, and the price of oil bumped up 31 cents a barrel. A new life for more than 250 people. The Arusa Sun carries refugees from Hungary. Those who fought against a tyrannical government and then fled when their cause was crushed by Russian tanks. More than 3,000 people jammed the dockyard to shout their welcome. And they marched down the liner's gangplank onto Canadian soil, accompanied by the music of the Royal 22nd Regiment's band. Canada is one of the few countries accepting Vietnamese refugees. Under our present quota, by the end of the year, we will have taken 2,000 from Hong Kong. For the past six months, it's been up to a dedicated 22-year-old Montrealer, Scott Mullen, to decide who gets in and who doesn't. Okay, we will accept his application to go to Canada. How do you know they can adapt to Canada? Well, if somebody can sail across the South China Sea and spend two months on sea, a few months here in a camp situation like this, I think they'll be able to adapt reasonably well. Noon time, and the would-be refugees are allowed outside for an hour. When the hour is up, they go back, single file, into the stuffy gymnasium that is their home. The Canadian government hasn't had to publicly explain why it's detaining these people for so long, except to say that it doesn't yet know for sure who they really are or whether they'll show up for their immigration hearings. All of the other illegal immigrants that have come here, they haven't been treated that way. The uh, turbans and beards are a great influence 
Members of the local Sikh community are upset with the way the government and the way the Canadian public has reacted to this latest boatload of people. This is the image that stands out most in people's minds. I think they should ship them all back where they come from. Canada will give political asylum to 26,000 Yugoslavian refugees. While it's welcome news, refugee advocates say the Canadian government is playing a dangerous double standard. They say refugees from Somalia should get the same treatment as those from Yugoslavia. As we know, the civil war and also the famine has displaced millions of people. We want justice! Yesterday, Somalis protested outside of immigration offices calling for fair treatment. Most Somalis more than Sarajevo. So if they don't give it down to Somalia... Give him our peace. Different language, different culture, different lives. You can see the strain on so many faces. Crammed into a gymnasium, the refugees listen to the Prime Minister explain he hopes they can one day return to their homeland if they choose. And I'm sure that you can feel at home among us. As you can see, children are crying here because of hunger. We are not getting to buy to our children. That's Jennifer pregnant and struggling to feed her small children. The family is one of many that fled South Sudan's brutal civil war, resettling in neighboring Uganda. Today, a new UN report said the number of South Sudanese refugees in that country now exceeds one million. The vast majority are women and children in urgent need of aid. Our Margaret Evans was in South Sudan this past spring and witnessed the deadly famine caused by the ongoing civil war and resulting economic collapse. Tonight, we revisit the lean season. They call it the lean season, the time between harvests, and it's already lean enough in northern Bar al Ghazal. The soft lines at sunset are an illusion. This is a harsh place, and not everyone will survive it. The dark folds of one of the few primary health care clinics in the region. Bonds between mother and child stretch taut. Two-year-old Maduak Deng weighs four kilograms and manages to look older than the universe. His mother walked two hours to bring him here. Five other children at home on their own. No husband and the firewood she sells doesn't earn enough to feed them. Here, they're trying fortified milk on Deng. His grip on the feeding cup is a good sign. The number of children suffering from acute malnutrition is rising every day here, say health workers. Some families are surviving on leaves. You may see some mothers speaking that, and when you ask, they say that that is what they live on. They don't have any other thing. And uh, other mothers say that they have nothing completely in their households. This woman says she knows her three-year-old is starving, but that she can't give what she doesn't have. And hunger lives even in the larger towns. When monitors declared famine conditions in two parts of South Sudan in February, they also warned that this state was at risk. 61% of people living here in emergency and catastrophic conditions, even though it's considered relatively stable compared to the rest of the country. That doesn't mean it's escaped the impact of the war. The capital, a wheel, is a frontier town that once relied on trade routes to the north and south. Now borders are closed and supply lines broken by fighting. Traders say inflation is crippling. And now it's, the prices is high and the buy is not like the past. Everything is not like the past. South Sudanese refugees who returned to celebrate independence from Sudan in 2011 are now looking to leave again. Aduka Tien is selling her cooking pots to earn the bus fare for her family. It's bad here, she says. I don't expect anything to get better soon. Government money goes to buying arms, say critics, and not to helping the people. This is a brand new maternity hospital paid for with Canadian aid money. But the state minister for health has no budget and isn't sure she'll be able to actually run it. 
and yours they are helping us a lot and that why this the 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 hospital is functioning without with them i don't know what we will do the feeling of helplessness is an epidemic unto itself first deborah ahawk lost her husband now she's losing her sight she has nine children who eat once a day if they're lucky if I go blind completely, she says, I have no idea what I'll do. We meet a hook again a few days later by chance at a feeding clinic for children. Even though she lives nearby, outreach workers were the one to spot a hook's youngest daughter, Monica, alarmed by her size, convincing her mother to bring her in. Some women say aid workers are too ashamed to admit to a starving child. These women are desperate. They've reached a situation where they have no control over the health of their children because they can't provide food for them. Like the other women here with children on the cusp, Ahok is given some peanut paste as treatment. But with eight other children at home, it will be hard to keep it for Monica alone. A terrible choice for a mother in a land where there are so few. Margaret Evans, CBC News, in a wheel, South Sudan. The famine in South Sudan is now over thanks to an increase in aid. According to the federal government, Canadians donated more than $21 million to famine relief charities in East Africa. But today, the UN said action is still needed to help people fleeing South Sudan, describing it as the fastest growing refugee crisis in the world. When we come back, we're going to turn our gaze up, way up. The National with Milton Nash. Good evening and welcome to rainy Vancouver and Expo 86. The province they call Supernatural is ready. They've been drilling, painting, cleaning and checking all week. I think everyone's uh, relatively calm. There's everything here from the world's biggest flagpole to the world's biggest hockey stick and the world's biggest hockey puck. You never know what you'll see next and you never know who you're going to meet next. There's the mascot of the fair, Expo Ernie. Look up, left my little robotic heart. No national crew from the national. How do you do? Glad to have you here. Expo is a fair about transportation. So this state-of-the-art monorail was a natural. For the first two months, it kept breaking down, but now it's carrying capacity crowds. The sun shone for the first time in weeks in Vancouver today, and with the sun, Expo 86 came alive. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people got to see the fair for the first time. Being Saturday, it was a big day for the children. And for children, what counts at a fair is the fun. There was no shortage of that. Just great. It's bringing the whole country together, too. $5,000 is spent every night by Expo for a computerized laser and fireworks show. It's called International Nights of Fire. We've never seen fireworks like that before. Oh, that was awesome. At 86th Street, they party with the Powder Blues Band, and they obey the rules to eat, drink, and go crazy. When they first opened, these nightclubs had so many customers, things sometimes got out of hand. So extra doormen were hired, proper dress is now required. The people who don't like dress codes still have a place to go, though. At the Irish pub, there doesn't seem to be any code at all. Expo has done itself proud. That's yeah. great. They did well. I enjoyed yeah. myself like no other time. It's the best thing that ever happened to British Columbia and to me. I love it. I've had a great time here. When we said, when we said in the House of Commons that that was the most ridiculous policy ever, then, Mr. Then... If you will just wait, the truth will be given to you. To unfurl a flag that is truly distinctive and truly national in character. As Canadian as a maple leaf on your badge. When the cavalcade rolled up to a stage where Trudeau was to make remarks in support of the local candidates, he was confronted by sign-carrying hecklers again. 
this time protesting high unemployment. Trudeau's response, as it has been throughout this campaign, was to fight back. Yeah, we saw you last night with your painted and hired signs and your hired friends. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of you holding signs like little boys. Come on, go and look for some jobs. No, you're lost without your notes. This lady just wouldn't give up and kept up a barrage of one-liners throughout the speech. Are you running as a rhinoceros or as a liberal? Eh? No rah-rah speeches. The truth. Mulroney was frequently interrupted by a large and unusually provocative group of hecklers, most of them striking workers at the Gainers meatpacking plant in Edmonton. Mulroney appealed for calm, didn't get it, and I didn't like it. You can yell and you can scream all you want. I fought bigger and better people than you, and I'll do it again. As the Prime Minister continued toward his car, he came face to face with one of the demonstrators. Suddenly, Chrétien took the man by the back of the neck. His other hand was over the protester's mouth. He pushed him aside. Seconds later, another protester approached the Prime Minister. Chrétien knocked over the bullhorn that was in his hand. But he was right in front of me, shouting and trying to block my way, so I took him out. Eclipse madness is sweeping North America. For the first time in 30 years, a total solar eclipse will cut across the entire United States. Anyone in its path will experience totality. The moment when the moon crosses between the Earth and the sun and completely blocks out the sun's light. People go crazy. <laughs> it's nuts. It's crazy. Interest in the eclipse is also crazy. Many. Canadians included plan to chase the shadow of the moon. So I sat down with CBC's science correspondent and the host of Quirks and Quarks, Bob McDonald. I am an avid eclipse chaser. <laughs> I've been chasing them since the 1970s. To answer your questions about Monday's celestial spectacle. Bob, I am so glad you're here <laughs> because we got questions oh, that's great, from it? viewers. It's incredible the tremendous interest in this event and I know that's something that you don't just understand you share you bet I share I've seen six total really? eclipses yes around the world I've seen them in the middle of the Pacific Ocean I saw one in Africa I saw one in Indonesia I saw one in Hawaii I saw one here in Canada they, they happen all over the world they're a great excuse to travel and it's one of the most spectacular sights you can see if you're in the right place at the right time there's a very narrow place you got to be but boy it's more than just the moon passing in front of the Sun the whole environment changes everything changes uh, uh, the sky turns color, this cobalt blue fades down to a gold all the way around the horizon, like no, nothing you've ever seen before. And this is all happening in the middle of the day. The temperature goes down, birds take off, people go crazy, it's nuts, it's crazy. <laughs> As you wax poetic, yes. I can't wait for the event to arrive. Uh, and we're going to talk about where people can see what in the course of our conversation today. But can we start with the basics and our viewer questions? I put the question to my nieces, 11-year-old mm -hmm. Asha, 9-year-old Jessica, who were not really quite understanding why there's such a hoopla over this. So let's begin there. Why is this so rare? Well, actually, it's not rare, Heather. It ah. actually happens all the time. But for any one spot on the Earth, it is rare. But eclipses are common. So let's let's just get back to basics, as okay. you said. So we have our planet Earth, uh, which spins on its axis once a day, and it goes around the sun. So I'm going to make you the sun. Okay. Okay. You're the very, center of your universe? You're very bright, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Earth would be going around right. your head like this, and we're doing this. The moon, and by the way, this isn't big enough. The moon's bigger than this, which is easy for me. So the moon goes around the Earth once a month. Now, if the moon went around the Earth, around the equator like this, we would have an eclipse every month because an eclipse is just when the sun, the moon, and the Earth all line up. Okay. And all the eclipse is is the shadow of the moon cast on the Earth. That's all it is. Just a shadow going by. Big deal. What's the big deal, right? Just a shadow. But it doesn't happen every month because, for one thing, the Earth is tipped a bit uh -huh. on its axis like this, and the moon does not go around the middle. It's on, it's on an angle. Its orbit goes up and down like this. So usually its shadow is either above us or below us, so it misses us. But it depends what part of the Earth is facing the I sun that see. day. It's always spinning. 
So while they do happen every couple of years, the shadow might pass over an ocean, which it usually does, or uh, another country. This time, it happens to be passing right over North America, and the path of totality is across the United States. And it hasn't done that since 1979? Something Decades, like, anyway. Yeah, 1979, yes. it went across Canada, and there was one that went up through uh, Winnipeg, uh, or Brandon, Manitoba, and Red Lake, Ontario. That was one I saw. And there's another one that's going to come this way in uh, 2024, I think. We're going to mm. see the next one. Okay. Hence the excitement if it happens where you are. Yeah. It's amazing that they can predict when they're going to return to. Uh, it's remarkably uh, precise because the moon is a, a very good clock and so is, so is the earth. <laughs> All right. Okay. So as you said, in Canada, we're not going to be in the path of totality. So let me bring in some other questions. From Edith Dixon, you mentioned that in Canada, Canada won't be in the path of totality. But Edith wants to know, will we be able to see the eclipse in southwestern Ontario what day and at what time? Well, the date is August 21st, and for Southern Ontario, uh, it begins around uh, noon and it goes till about 1.30, around totality. But for all of Canada, we will not see the total eclipse because uh, th we're only gonna see part of the sun covered. In Vancouver, it starts around uh, 9.30 in the morning. So mm -hmm. Vancouver is going to see about almost 90% of the sun covered. So it'll turn into a very thin crescent, but there will still be sun visible. And in southern Ontario, uh, it's, uh, I think, about 75% covered. So a little more than half the moon will be covered. You'll see it looking, looking like a disk, or like a sort of a sickle shape is okay. what the sun will look like. So Canada is only getting a partial eclipse. Partial. If you want to see totality, that thing I was talking about where the whole sky changes, there's a very narrow band that runs from Oregon to South Carolina right across the United States. And it's only about 100 kilometers wide. It, it changes depending on where and, and uh, what, uh, what location you're at. But that's where you need to be to see totality. And many are going there. Including me. I'm, I'm going to <laughs> Casper, Wyoming. Oh, really? Uh, because it's a desert state. I'm hoping for clear skies. When you say you have to look at this and you have to protect your eyes, the natural tendency would, see would be, I want to see what this is. Yes. And I want to experience it for myself. Georgina Johnson, with a question exactly to that point, what eye protection do you need to safely watch the eclipse? Right, so in Canada, everyone needs eye protection. You cannot watch this with your eyes anywhere in Canada. So uh, one of the things you can do, there are these commercial uh, eclipse viewers that are now available, mm -hmm. and you have to make sure that they have certification on the back that says that they've been certified and also endorsed by the International Astronomical Union. Okay. Uh, because there are lots of scams there are out, fakes there, out there, aren't there? Sunglasses don't do it. Uh, you can use welding glass. Sometimes that'll work. But you need these things uh, to do it. They have to be approved. And the way you know that they work is that uh, when you put these things on, what do you think? You it's like, a good look. Like that? Good look for you. You yeah. should see absolutely nothing at all. Really? There, you, there should be nothing. Even I'm looking at a really bright spotlight now. I can see nothing. It's only the sun that will go through this. And, and even when you see that, it's very, very dim. So if you can see anything through this besides the sun, don't use them. The other thing to do is to hold them up to a bright light, and if you see any pinholes in them, mm -hmm. don't use them. Okay, so if they're, they're bent or, or wrinkled. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to do it is Even that. in a partial eclipse situation, partial that, solar eclipse situation. Especially in the partial especially. eclipse. Because during the total eclipse, you don't need these. That's the beauty of it. During the total eclipse, you look out, and the sun is completely covered. And you see this incredible corona, the atmosphere of the sun that sticks out beyond it. it. It looks like a combination of highly polished silver and rabbit's fur. It's, it's I'm going to mull that over it, for a moment. It's, it's brilliant white, but there's no edge to it. It's just this, it's got these like filaments and hair sticking out on the edges of it. That's and you beautiful. can look at this with your eye. It's the atmosphere of the sun. And then within that, sometimes there are these blood red tongues sticking out, which are huge eruptions coming off the sun that are bigger than the earth. And you can see this with your eye. With your naked but eye. But it's only during to tell. So in, in Canada, you can't do that. Okay, so, so you need protection you like need this. this. And Here's, not to be fear mongers or, yeah. you know, to, to raise concerns, but what are the dangers of looking at without protection like You'll that. You'll fry your eyeball. You'll fry your eyeball. You know how you can take a magnifying glass and burn a piece of yes. paper in the sun? That's what your eyes will do. The lens of your eye is a magnifying glass. It'll fry your retina. But you're naturally not going to look at it. As soon as you look at the sun, it's too bright. You don't. So, so don't do it, okay? okay? Just don't do it. Here's another way, okay? Another tech All technique. Right. Uh, this is the one I like. Uh, you take a pair of binoculars, and again, never, ever, ever Look at the sun through binoculars. Okay. So instead, you turn your back to the sun. 
put the binoculars over your shoulder like this, point the binoculars at the sun, and then, see if I can do this, take a piece of paper and project the sun on the paper. It'll and go you, right there, you'll see it. It'll, it'll go through the binoculars, you will get two images of the sun, you can even focus it, and you'll see it. You'll see a perfectly clear image of the sun. You might even see sun spots, uh, dark spots on the sun. And do it in your own shadow. So put, put the stand like this with the sun behind you and project it down and you'll see two perfectly clear images. Uh, you can do it on a white wall, you could do it on a sidewalk. So that's, that's another way. But never look, but through, never the look through these yourself. And the third way yes. is to make a pinhole camera. Now I've tried it using two pieces of paper where um, you just put a little pin. Can I borrow your pen? Sure. Okay, so you just, just punch a little hole in a piece of paper, just with a pen, okay. very small hole, and, and make a projector like that. I, this doesn't work, you'll, you'll see a little crescent that way, or you can use your fingers. Uh, you, I've done this as well, <laughs> I've done this while writing away. Um, you, you make your fingers into a cross like this, right. and then bring them all together so that there's, there's very, very small openings like this, and project that onto the ground, and you'll see a bunch of little crescents, which is the crescent sun. And you can also, if you're, if you're underneath a leafy tree, the, the, the space between the leaves will sometimes make little crescents on the ground, you can see. Fantastic. So there's lots of different ways to see it, but don't look at it no, with your eyes. sounds okay? like the binoculars might give you perhaps that's the, the, best. the, the best that's view the best of all of that. Yeah. And what about, I mean, that's obviously the same rule for everyone. I was thinking back to an eclipse, a solar eclipse. It may have been total years and years ago. But when I was a little girl, my mother in the house, closing all the drapes, keeping right. it so dark, so afraid that I, little girl, might inadvertently yeah. look out and uh, cause damage. So Zara wonders, are children at any particular risk? Well, children are at as much risk as anybody. Uh, they are curious. They, uh, they do want to look up. So I don't want to be a, a fear monger about this and say, you know, like, oh, no, don't go outside, don't go outside. Educate the kids. Educate the kids. Tell them what's going on. Make them smart. Kids are smart enough. They can figure it out. Don't look at the sun directly and show them these other ways to see what's going on and explain it to them. I think everybody will be fine. Don't miss the experience. Jennifer Anderson writes, again, along this point, is it dangerous to be out and about driving? No. Um, like I say, most people, uh, especially in, towards the east where the effect isn't as great, might not even notice because it'll just seem like, well, it's a cloudy day today. Gee, this kind of dull out, but keep going on with their thing. In Canada, you've mentioned the best viewing will be on the West Coast. West. So Sharon Patterson wonders about the wildfires. Of course, in the interior of BC, we've been talking about that, the smoky skies <laughs> and that. the haze. You're living that. That's where yeah. you're based, of course. Uh, how will the skies affect viewing? Well, the, um, <clears throat> the smoke will make it um, more difficult to see the corona, the atmosphere of the sun, that white uh, surrounding it. But it might actually provide uh, an interesting filter because I've been noticing over the last while with all the smoke in BC that the sun has been red. Hmm. And uh, when it rises, we're having red sunrises and red sunsets. So as the sunlight goes down, it'll probably turn into a red crescent, which could be very, very interesting. All right. Uh, from Diane, similar to this point, obviously um, the cloud, the haze, the smoke is going to affect the viewing. But conversely, will the eclipse affect the weather. That's actually one of the scientific investigations they're doing during this. They're going to be flying jets up uh, trying to chase the, uh, the, 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 the shadow across because there is a cooling effect that happens. You're shading the sun. So the atmosphere on a very local scale does go down and you feel it during totality. The temperature drops, especially uh, the ones that I've seen in the tropics like Africa. It's a hot, sweaty day. You're out at noon, you know, mad dogs and Englishmen outside in the <laughs> hot sun. You're sweating like crazy. But then all of a sudden it turns quite cool and it's very nice. So there are um, local effects where the atmosphere does cool. And the scientists are very interesting, interested in the changes in the atmosphere, how much shading the sun does that. Because, you know, there are some crazy schemes in the future to try to avert global warming mm -hmm. by putting stuff up in the atmosphere to shade the sun to try to do this. And we don't know if that experiment is going to work. So here's a natural experiment that's going to come along. For a few minutes, we're going to shade the sun and see what happens in the atmosphere. So there's a lot of interest in that, not just the eclipse, but what's happening on the Earth as well. So Following up on that point of those NASA planes that are going to fly within the path of totality to do their research, Dennis Enns wondered how fast he would have to fly to keep under the total eclipse. Uh, very fast. You would need a supersonic jet to really? do it, and even that have. wouldn't keep up with it. Um, the shadow itself 
it, the speed changes as it goes across the Earth because the surface of the Earth is curved. So it's fast at the beginning, then it slows down, then it speeds up again. But it's generally around 2,300 kilometers an hour, okay. which is uh, way beyond the speed of sound. Yes. So um, supersonic jets, I, I know there was once a plan to try to fly the Concorde uh, through uh, an eclipse that was happening in Siberia, and that was so fast, even the Concorde keep, couldn't keep up with it. Muhammad Ali commanded a respectful silence and then applause as he entered the ring. The daily workouts were pure show business. First an exhibition of speed and condition. And then on the last day of training, he put on a surprise performance. And who's the champ for Canada too? Who's the heavyweight champ for Canada? Americans in here. What other countries do we have in here? England. How many from England? Who? Israel. 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 Am I the champ in Israel? I'm not the champ in Israel. All right. So name but one of you in here. You better be good. I don't want no smart stuff now. <laughs> Can anybody just take my tail out of the ring? Was you ever settled for that? Oh, no, right? No. All right, that's all. You can go now. <laughs> all of you who bought pictures, I'm going to put my name on it for you. Take time and autograph all your pictures. And because this will be worth about $10,000 in another two years. <laughs> So people here in Canada, I've never been treated so nice in my life. I haven't had no people uh, making wise cracks. Everybody's friendly, the children, the waitresses, the hotel managers, the policemen. Everybody's as nice as they can be. And it's a lot different from where I come from. I'm Lloyd Robertson at Control Central in Winnipeg, introducing our CBC television coverage of the 1967 Pan American Games. And we are having another one of the intermittent showers that have been on and off all afternoon here in Winnipeg. However, the spunky Duke of Edinburgh is nonetheless traveling in an open car and is now halfway around the track. He is going to be officially opening these games. And those well-formed lines are uh, obviously falling apart all over the place. A well-organized parade up to this point, but now it's uh, it's been impossible to keep these lines in order during the rain. Uh, nonetheless, some of them are stalwartly carrying on. The delegation from the Netherlands Antilles. His Royal Highness looking up skyward a little bit, and he gets very little encouragement from there because there's an immense black cloud parked right over the top of Winnipeg's stadium. Funnily enough, Lloyd, I don't know, maybe this augurs well, but the rain stopped as Canada came by. Right, the rain is stopping and uh, the weather has contributed to an air of conviviality. A little bit of sun is beginning to sneak through. I have the great pleasure and honor to declare the fifth Pan American Games open. So let me bring in some other questions. Um, from Charla Soli, a question, again, that speaks to the rarity of this, because the perception is, why is it that Canada never experiences a total solar eclipse? And you've already said it happens, yes. but why not more often? Well, uh, it's, it's rare for, for any one part of the country. Again, it's because, it's because the Earth is spinning, because of the, the mechanics of the moon is going up and down, and so you never know which part of the, well, we, different parts of the country or different parts of the globe are going to be facing. But Canada did have one in 1979 that went across um, Manitoba and Ontario, then out to the east, and in the 1960s, you mentioned earlier, you saw one mm -hmm. as a kid, I remember mm -hmm. that as well, and in fact, there's a 
song by Carly Simon called You're So Vain. Sure. And one of the lines was, <clears throat> you flew your Learjet to Nova Scotia to see a total eclipse of, of the sun. sun. That, was, that was in the early 1960s. Exactly. And that one went through Nova Scotia. And we have one coming up in 2024 that's going to go right over Toronto. And it's going to go over the East Coast. It's going to be stunning. All right. I'm booking you for seven years out. We'll talk about this again. Can you yeah. hold that up again and, and hold up the ball, which you said is not the right proportion? Right. So again, so the moon, how much smaller than the than Earth? Uh, the, the moon's about half the size of the Earth, okay. but it's 400 times smaller than, than the, the sun. sun. Okay. The sun's 400 times far, farther away, so they appear they, the, same the same size. But how does it that the moon, which is that size relative to both the sun and the Earth, how is it that it's able to cast a shadow that's about 110 kilometers wide? Again, good question. Um, oh, that was the, Jane Edmonds' question. Yes, yes. Well, the, the shadow that the moon casts is a cone. So it starts out as the width of the moon, but then as it comes to the, to the Earth, it's a cone. And we're right at the tip of the cone. Okay. So that's why the, the, the shadow is so small. Now, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. The moon is very slowly getting further away from the Earth. Every year, it's about three or four centimeters further away. So eventually, it'll be too far away, and that cone will not reach the Earth, and we will no longer have total solar eclipses. We'll only have annular eclipses. The moon will be too small, so the mm. sun will look like a ring which we do get now because the moon's mm -hmm, distance mm -hmm. does vary a bit. But eventually, we won't have total solar eclipses at all. So uh, see them now. By the way, they're going to disappear 620 million years from now. Oh. <laughs> we should be so okay. We, we still should be okay. But eventually, they will stop. So like I say, it's unique to the Earth. We're the only planet that has total solar eclipses. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fabulous that we get, to, we get to see them. And this one get to drive to it. How nice. We have something else that's unique. And Paul Tilley has picked up on that in his question. We call that the moon. Why isn't there something more romantic like Phobos or Ganymede or, you know, Callisto or yeah, Europa or any of the other great moon I names? I, I, I agree. I agree. That's the, our moon has the, the, the worst name, the. What a terrible moon, the. Although she's also been called Luna, mm -hmm. which is nice. Um, but yeah, I think we should come up with a, with a better name. Uh, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, uh, all these. One, Triton, Titan. Uh, I don't know. It's just always been Cast there. I guess. Mind to that. Sort of next door, you take it for granted. Oh, yeah, the old moon. Yeah, yeah it's always there. <laughs> Our final viewer question. We come back to a, a child's perception. Axton Morris, who's nine, wondering what would happen if not the moon, but a huge asteroid passed by the sun. Would that create an eclipse? Um, it would, but it would not cover the entire sun because asteroids are much, much smaller. Asteroids are flying mountains. If there was an asteroid large enough to cause an eclipse of the sun, I would be worried more about the <laughs> asteroid than I would about the eclipse, because something that big uh, would wipe out everything on Earth. That'd we, be a, we not a near miss. Yeah, yeah, that would not be a good day. So uh, asteroids are far too small to do that. As far Axton, as that's a great question. <laughs> and all of our viewer questions were amazing. Thank you uh, for them. I have one more question. You mentioned NASA jets flying. What do scientists hope to learn from studying this eclipse? Eclipses uh, provide us with a view of the sun's atmosphere that we can't get otherwise. There's a mystery on the sun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know the sun is a ball of gas, but it actually has an atmosphere above that, this corona. And it turns out that the corona is hotter than the sun itself. We think the sun's pretty hot, mm -hmm. you know, 50 million degrees in the middle, 10,000 on the outside. The corona. As soon as you get above the surface of the sun, it goes up to more than a million degrees. And there's always been a question, why is it so hot? What's, mm -hmm. the, what's the source of that? Mm -hmm. In order to see that, you've got to get right to the surface. And our telescopes, they put artificial moons in them. It's called a coronagraph. You put in a little thing to replicate the moon to cover the sun so that you can look down at the base of the corona. They're not as good as the moon itself. So the moon is so good at covering the sun so exactly, we can see right down to the base of that corona and see that area where that heating is happening okay. and try to answer this mystery. They've got some pretty good ideas, but that's one of the things they'll be looking at. So they'll be looking at the mystery of the corona itself, which is important because we live in it. We live within the sun. Mm -hmm. The sun's atmosphere extends right out. We get northern lights mm -hmm. because of the mm -hmm. particles coming from mm -hmm. the sun. We get our power systems knocked out every mm -hmm. once in a while because of storms on the sun. So it's really important to know this area right at the, at the base of that corona. So eclipses are the best way to do that. They only get a few minutes to do it, but they're looking pretty, pretty hard. I understand the magic. You know, I got 
a message from a viewer saying how much he was looking forward to this segment because Bob makes science so interesting. <laughs> you always do. You have again. Thank you so much. So answer. get on that motorcycle and head down there. Sure. Can I persuade you to do some reporting for we'll, us uh, from we'll there? We'll see what we can do. I don't know where exactly I'm going to be, but it might be on Skype or my cell phone. But All right. Absolutely. Stay we'll tuned on CBC News. Okay. Thank you so much for Thank this. Thank you, Heather. It's been a great pleasure. Now, our interactive team has created an easy-to-use resource for everything you'll need no matter where you are on Monday. You can follow the exact path the eclipse will take or put in your location and find out minute by minute just how close you'll be to totality. Go to cbcnews.ca and follow the links. When we come back, we will update today's top story, the deadly van attack in Barcelona. It was middle-class Canada on wheels, a convoy of buses carrying hundreds of homeowners protesting against Canada's soaring interest rates. Most of the protesters face crushing mortgages of more than 20%. Some face losing their homes altogether. All of them are angry. I'm angry and I'm helpless. I just feel helpless. I mean, what are we going to do? I'm just sick and tired of this kind of a government. Vince and Linda White are typical. This month, their mortgage payments go from $650 to more than $1,000. I think there's something has to be done about it. I think it's ridiculous. I mean, too many people are losing their homes. As the so-called convoy of anger rolled on towards Ottawa, federal Liberal MPs were meeting in special caucus. Like the protesters, their message was the federal government must do something for homeowners. When the buses arrived on Parliament Hill, they were met by opposition politicians, but there was no one there from the Trudeau government. The demonstrators went ahead and told their stories anyway. I'm sick of an economic policy that tells me that after five years of blood and sweat and tears that I can't have my home anymore? I want to know why. Why can't I have my home? Later, a small group was allowed to meet Housing Minister Paul Cosgrove. All we are getting from you people are shrugs. Well, tighten your belts, but we've done it as tight as we can do it. We're the work people you're working for. We put you in office, and believe me, we can take you out. We don't want promises. We want people who are out of their homes now to have action now. Not after the budget, not after promises, but now. False prophets. I don't know what the particular response will be, but I'll tell you that the government will meet its commitment in the speech from the throne when we started out as a liberal government last year that we will not stand by and see large-scale foreclosure of people's homes in this country. As the Liberal caucus broke up, MPs emerged smiling. They'd been told help was coming for homeowners. And Cosgrove announced that he'll ask Canadian banks and trust companies to stop foreclosing on Canadians, at least until after next month's budget. I know that the, uh, that, that the companies have said that they'll look to all devices that they can to assist people to maintain home ownership. Prime Minister Trudeau left the caucus meeting apparently confident that he'd cooled out his angry backbenchers. The angry homeowners will have to await the outcome of a special two-day cabinet meeting which begins tomorrow and the resumption of Parliament next month before they learn the extent of government plans to deal with the interest rates crunch. Summer is golden. The CBC Sports app, 500 plus hours of live competition. Download the CBC Sports app. An update before we go on a terrible day in Spain. Dramatic video in now from a coastal town south of Barcelona. La puta. 
Police in Canberra say they have killed four people and wounded another who is in custody. The five were suspected of attempting a second terrorist attack late tonight, which officials say they believe was connected to the first. Now, that one happened in Barcelona. Thirteen people were killed when a van purposely careened down a busy tourist boulevard. About 100 people were injured. Police arrested two men, but there is a manhunt ongoing for the driver. That's the national for this Thursday night. For the latest out of Spain and news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Heather Hiscox. Thank you for watching.